This boy is being sent on a mission to enter enemy lines, but the catch is the enemy are all girls. He's stuck in a world where men live in one nation, while the women live on the other half of the continent. Currently, the girls actually rule the world and are stronger, where they call themselves foxes, while the guys call themselves the wolves. With Herring heralded as one of the lucky chosen ones to attend, his hometown village bids farewell as he will be allowed to destroy some rice cakes at the capital city of the Crimson Foxes. However, Herring is part of an elite squad called the Garimbi, and there seems to be a peculiar wind blowing in the air on this very sussy and specific day. Nevertheless, he gets escorted back home to the special headquarters, but the rest of the lowly special forces are still going on about him destroying the legendary swordsman Ara Yunsu. Upon entering the Garimbi Elite open area, Herring is surprised to see that no one is back yet from their vacation. Out of nowhere, Marvis startles our boy by sneaking up on him undetected, where he proceeded to blow air into his ear and neck. After trolling Herring, Maru orders him to follow him quickly, as he's got something special to show him. Herring then finds himself following Maru outside headquarters, where he discovers Wong here as well, but now both of them begin to arm themselves with a weapon. After handing Herring a wooden sword, the other two Garimbi members start circling him, as they want to test his ability to defend himself since something feels off about the upcoming gomage. And so Maru and Wong ambush Herring, ordering him to fight like his life depends on it, as he could actually perish in the hands of the Crimson Foxes. Now stuck in the middle of two swordsmen ranked within the top five of the wolves, Herring finds himself in a sticky situation. However, Herring channels his inner Tanjiro and activates his water rice cake pounding technique, allowing him to enter flow state to counter easily. After landing a quick counterattack, Maru is sent flying back as Herring makes him look like an F-tier gacha pull. After making quick use of Maru, Herring turns around and finishes off Wong as well with one single strike, as if he swiped left as fast as he could on Tinder. With both now laying helplessly on the ground, our boy decides to mock them by telling them that it looks like they aren't trying hard enough to beat him. As such, Maru gets back up on his feet quickly, only for him to start maniacally laughing like an evil villain, so Wong joins in with a smile, claiming that the trio may now talk after his display of power. They then reveal that the Black Serang is not attending the Gomage this year as he left for an unknown mission in the morning. Elsewhere, Ara is busy sitting on top of a roof with some pants missing staring off into the sky, so I bet those rice cakes are cold as heck. Fast forward to the day of the Gomage during dawn, two leaders show up on horseback alerting the city lookouts that it's time to ring all the bells as the Gomage will soon begin. The city gates then open with a Black Thorn leader ready to welcome the caravan of the Black Wolves into the capital city of the Crimson Foxes. With news spreading quickly that the wolves are to arrive at any moment, everyone in the city hurriedly lines up to see a boy for the first time ever. As they begin passing through the city gates, every fox looks unflustered as each and every single one of them always wish for a rice cake smashing, just like the boys. Audible gasps then begin to erupt as they get a closer look at the wolves with Baek Mu leading the charge forward. Silence then ensues as the first-timers from both sides finally make eye contact, so the tension between both genders must be through the roof. Soon enough, the entire city of women will be glistening as half will no longer be labeled as immaculate maidens after their city walls get battered through. Suddenly, the city guards order every wolf to get off their horses and caravans, commanding them to walk on foot from here on out. Herring then discovers the site that the Gomage is going to take place in, so he makes a remark that it looks eerily like a prison. The Black Thorn leader hears his remark, so she tells him that he's absolutely right and all they need to do is place a lock on all the doors for it to quickly become one. She then grins as she continues on as she recognizes the Prince Behemoth, asking him if he's actually Herring. Upon uttering the name Herring, every single person within earshot instantly turns to look at him, as he's basically Mr. Beast but gives away unlimited banana tree seeds instead of money. His riz level is so high that upon hearing his name, every single girl gets flustered while they all instinctively attempt their best duck face pose to appease him. Even some of the guys get flustered as they all know him as the legendary Prince Behemoth, but the rest of the boys are super jealous of the amazing gift of Herring having the largest banana plantation in the world. With all the commotion now surrounding his mystical presence, Herring catches a glimpse of two familiar faces far off in the corner of his eye. After activating Eagle Eye, he notices Blondie and Ara standing guard alongside other Black Thorn members. Upon realizing and seeing Ara once again, Herring instantly smiles and continues on staring at the future queen, just like me when I see ice cream cake. Blondie is then shocked to see Herring's face, as she now knows her bestie has captivated the heart of the Prince Behemoth. Ara then tries her hardest to not melt under the pressure of Herring's presence, but she gets distracted by him as she can only stare back. 
With a black foreign leader realizing Ara is distracted, she orders her to snap out of it as she's tasked to keep an eye out on the blacklisted Karim. Unlike every other wolf within the Crimson Fox City, Karim is the only with multiple black foreign members trailing his every move. They then surround Karim, worried that the blacklisted man might have something up his sleeve, as it's unheard of for a rank 1 swordsman to willfully enter enemy gates with his guard down. Even Blondie and Ara are surprised to see him, since they think Karim is the future of the wolves, and there's no way they would ever risk him falling into captivity. Regardless, Karim the Simp is the first one to enter the building destined to help both populations prosper. Unfortunately, Karim will get his banana seeds extracted by someone other than his only love. With Herring lining up as well, Ara is forced to look on in jealousy as she can't do anything to stop her true love from rice cake destroying some other crimson fox. And so Herring gets escorted to one of the many rooms inside, where he must stay for the entire day to fulfill the wishes of anyone coming in. In just two weeks, he went from never seeing a girl before, and now he's the most prized man due to his prince behemoth, and he also already conquered the first sword of the Crimson Foxes. Meanwhile, his captain is busy laying down on a king's size bed dejected, as he knows Ara will not be coming through his door at any point during the Gomage. On the other hand, Herring has mixed feelings about all of this since the place is totally different than Puzel, although the bright side is the fact that he got to see Ara again. As he's busy daydreaming about Ara, he is interrupted as he hears someone open his door while the person quickly closes it behind them. With Herring now on high alert about this aggressive woman coming in, he prepares for the worst or maybe the best, since it is time for some rice cakes after all. However, the girl swings into the air like Spider-Man, and upon closer look, he realizes it is none other than the OG Danby, the first of her kind to experience the behemoth. As soon as she lands on Herring, she begins to cry tears of joy asking him if he missed her and all as she can't believe she gets his second chance in life. Of course, Herring will remember the first girl he ever encountered as Danby was the gateway to the promised land due to her discovering his prince behemoth. After a quick kiss, Danby cries even more as she thought Herring would have already forgotten her name, but our Chad can never forget his conquests. So moral of the story, just grow your banana trees and no girl will ever forget about you. Plus, they will always throw themselves at you even if they know other girls have visited your banana plantation recently. Anyways, with a long time reunion coming, the two are quick to get started, as they both instantly get rid of their armors so they can get the show on the road. As Herring and Danby partner up, to the right of their door is Maru, and the first one into his room is actually Alita Battle Angel. And the first thing these two do is insult each other, as their bond is stronger than ever and soon they'll play in Connect 2 instead of Connect 4. Then for the first time ever, Maru admits that he's actually in love with Alita, so he literally sweeps her off her feet, as he cannot wait any longer. Now let's not forget about Hipster Wong as we all know he's eagerly waiting for Mira to show up. And guess who shows up? Mira herself, ready to rumble as she too have been waiting all this time to reunite with Wong. With everyone from the Garimbi elite already happy with all the girls coming through their door, only Karim looks dissatisfied so he lays down on his bed while exuding no emotion at all. Eventually, a girl walks through looking a little bit like a Ra, so Karim finally moves to take a closer look at who actually came in. But he's not the only one disappointed as some green-haired nerd has walked through the door, and it seems like he got the short end of the stick, although he is the captain after all. Karim then makes a remark about how she doesn't look like a civilian at all, so he asks if she's a member of the Black Thorn. Meanwhile, Edo Naren takes point at the nearby observatory tower, ordering the rest of the Black Thorn to make sure they report to her every hour about Karim's status, and she asks them to call forth Ara to see her. With the start of the Gomage, Naren begins to think to herself that this year's Gomage is more quiet than usual, so she wonders if there's going to be anything happening after all. Anyways, back to the action, Danby goes ham as she unleashes her true fox form, devouring the available meat inside their room. With the Prince Behemoth more experienced now, Danby hears herself accidentally echoing throughout every hallway, as she did not realize his battering ram has evolved tremendously over the past few weeks. As Herring fulfills his duty the best he can with his siege attacks, other wolves looking like the Anby Black Ops begin to appear all over Crimson Fox territory. Thus, the invasion of the wolves have begun, and it looks like the wolves might actually have the upper hand this time as they have already infiltrated deep within enemy lines. However, they patiently wait for a signal coming from the capital city of the Crimson Foxes, so they hide like some new bush campers. Now these guys are smart as the entire female population is busy distracted with the Gomage, and a huge number of elite Crimson Foxes are busy partaking within the event. So now the Crimson Foxes are understaffed with some of their strongest members busy without any armor and with their weapons far away from their hands. Nonetheless, the guards within the Gomez site continue to get even more jealous, as they get distracted by all the sounds piercing the thick walls, wishing it was them that got to partake in the legendary event. 
And since the Gomage happens only once every few full moons, the guards lose hope as they know the next one will happen once they get old as heck. Anyways, back to the action, green-haired girl faces off against Karim, where she's busy asking why he actually showed up to the Gomage. To her surprise, he actually answers, where Karim claims that he's only here to make sure that someone will be carrying his bloodline on in the future. He then continues on by saying that he thinks he might not have much time left in the world, so he's here to implant some seeds as a backup. Instead, the first one up is Jin Yanwa, who is revealed to be the second strongest crimson fox behind Ara. True to his duty of being the rank one for the wolves, he instantly dismantles his armor and readies his rocket to destroy Yanwa, just so she could extract his seeds to further his bloodline. But before she enters the race to help repopulate the world with Karim, she decides to apologize for being his second choice. As such, Karim apologizes as well as the feeling is mutual for both of them. And this just happens to be business as usual in this world. Elsewhere, Black Thorn leader, Edo Naren, finally gets to meet Era after ordering her to meet, as she had a burning question to ask her. But before she asks her question, our Komi look-alike gets lectured for choosing Herring the Prince Behemoth instead of Karim the King's Simp. Regardless, Naren asks if her plan is to reunite the Kingdom of Men and the Kingdom of Women if she becomes Queen of the Foxes one day. Without an ounce of hesitation, Ara confirms her plan that she wants to tear down the walls of division and one day reunite the wolves and the foxes. She then continues on by explaining that she believes that the two can actually coexist, and the foxes are strong enough to make sure that happens. Ara reasons that the wolves only get more violent the more desperate they become, as women are the only ones that can control humanity's population. With the wolves becoming more and more desperate as the days go by due to their dwindling population, Naren asks if she's actually willing to negotiate with the North Wind. Ara then shakes her head and says no, catching Naren by surprise as she reveals that she plans for the wolves to have a new king. Now shocked and confused by what she means, Naren asks if she's referring to Karim after all, he's the only one Naren thinks is capable of dethroning the current king. Unbeknownst to Naren, a new challenger for the throne has arrived and he isn't a simp or a soy boy. But instead, he's the Prince Behemoth that has taken the world of women by storm. Every crimson fox that stumbles onto Herring always somehow gets their rice cake destroyed, especially if they underestimate the meek-looking boy. Anyways, with Dambi being the first fox to arrive at Herring's room, she realizes that our boy has transformed in more ways than one. Not only has he become more experienced after beating multiple elite foxes, his banana tree plantation apparently also grown more mature than before. So Gamby tries her hardest to get his rocket to explode after liftoff, but her efforts are futile as she's the one being sent into the realm of no return. As she continues to try her hardest to channel her inner Royal Canadian Mounted Police experience, Herring softly tells her to just relax and take her time. Now Herring is a true gentleman as not only does he really care for Gamby, but he even allows her to climb Mount Climax before he does. Shortly after, he gets up with a fox mounted on the tip of the rocket, letting Danby know that she's one of the reasons he wants to now be king. Herring is actually big brain, since if he becomes king, then he can literally have as many crimson fox wives as he wants, and he can even watch his children grow alongside him. Anyways, he continues running his machine into the caves of Danby, but he reminds her that this time, he wants to make sure she can fulfill her lifelong mission of becoming prego like my egos. Meanwhile, Wong is relentless in his duel against Mira, telling her that he's been waiting all his life for the Gomage to finally happen and he always wishes her to be his partner. Now that's Cuban all. But then we have Maru cosplaying a jackhammer while Miss Alita Battle Angel tries to squeeze information out of him to why Kareem attended the Gomage. Maru claims he has no idea why he chose to come, which is actually true, so the two end up continuing to insult each other like usual. Nevertheless, outside the walls of the capital city of women, a storm ominously rumbles through the jungle which is a telltale sign that something is lurking on the horizon. Nearby city guards then get scared as the storm looms over as they don't want their socks to get wet while on duty, since they'll smell really bad like my bathroom after I drop a number two. As such, every girl now on guard begin to enter their homes to shelter themselves from the rain, while the rest hope for the best. However, a new face enters the fray as the girl looks like trouble, due to her looking eerily like the female version of Karim. Nevertheless, she scouts out her surroundings and proceeds to smile right before she puts on her hood to become a sussy and mysterious menace. Heavy rain then falls down upon the city, while the mysterious lady escapes into a nearby alleyway with a hidden weapon on her back. Elsewhere, men in black cloaks begin to pour through the neutral jungles of the Black Wolves territory straight into Crimson Fox territory. Luckily, some Crimson Fox sentries hidden throughout the border is able to spot the men on the move, but the sheer amount of soldiers begin to worry them. 
It's then revealed that there has always been a truce between both nations every time the Go Mage was going on, and for the first time ever, the Thirsty Wolves have broken the truce. With something large looming on the horizon, and we aren't talking about the Prince Behemoth, one of the sentries leaves to relay information while one stays back to keep watch. Unfortunately for the brave one, she gets ganked by a Black Wolves intelligence officer, leading to her demise with a quick back attack. With first blood now drawn by the Wolves, War has now been officially declared while multiple elite special force members are happily busy destroying rice cakes. Back at the capital city of the Foxes, Ara looks on from a window as Blondie hopes the two don't have to stand guard while it rains. Blondie then sighs as she wishes she was partaking in the Go Mage right now. Instead, rain will help her get wet instead of our teenage mutant ninja turtle doing the job. Meanwhile, Karim looks emotionless as Yanwo flops around trying to play whack-a-mole with the rocket of the strongest male swordsman. Eventually, as every other elite Garimbi member looks like they are about to explode simultaneously, Karim finally makes a face although not much, signaling to everyone that have finally completed their duty. With time almost up for the first batch of foxes to switch with round two, Herring notices how hard it's pouring outside. Suddenly, a voice is heard in every room within the Go Mage urging all foxes to quickly get ready to leave their rooms within the next ten minutes as time is now up. Miss Alita Battle Angel then reveals to Maru that her and Mira have rigged it so both of them will be their only respective partners the entire Go Mage. Maru and Wong is happy to hear the news as both of them feel the same way as they all actually like each other even though they are all arch nemesis. On the other hand, Karim finishes up Rocket exploding as well, but upon learning that he has other women waiting for him, he tells her no. He then claims that there will only be one woman in his life like a true Chad, so he asks for her name and Yanwa that he will remember her always. Next door to our evolved simp, Danby tells Herring to not forget her, but Herring reassures her that he will never ever forget her and promises to always remember. Now this is actually pretty wholesome, as Herring hugs her goodbye plus who knew King Simp would actually devote his future to the first one that took his blossom. Anyways, after 10 minutes have passed, all girls begin coming out of their respective rooms, all looking flustered, hopeful that each one of them will be lucky enough to fulfill their life-long wishes of becoming a mother. Meanwhile, Blondie and Ara try to hurry to get to their posts inside, but they get scolded as they were late to their shift. Ara then quickly notices a girl coming out of Herring's room, but all she could hear is Danby crying while vacating the premises. This causes her to get distracted, as she's probably thinking he made her cry tears of joy with how good Herring is when he wants to use the battering ram to its full effect. Yanwo leaves next, much to the surprise of everyone as Karim's mysterious partner was a hot topic amongst the guards. Regardless, as Yanwo vacates the room, she stares and looks at Era intently, as if she's jealous that she was the second choice because of the future queen. With the two giving each other the side eye, the Blackthorn supervisor interferes and yells at Ara to make sure she keeps an eye out as the men behind those runes are some of the strongest on the planet. And so Ara goes, are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain. And behind the door right beside her, Kareem stares out of the window and into the rain, almost looking like he wants to jump through wearing his birthday suit. Elsewhere, Yanwa, Murray, and Alita are called into questioning by Naren, as she wants to know if any of them were able to gain some valuable information from the useless wolves. As such, S-tier Yanwa without her glasses claims that Karim said nothing and uttered no words the entire time they were doing some rice cake smashing, likewise with Mary and Alita. With no useful information gathered, Naren asks if all three girls were able to extract seeds, but each and every one gets flustered as they all confirm mission success in gaining milk. Upon asking all the questions she needed, she orders the three to get out and to remember to report for duty tomorrow as she will need them. After being left alone, Naren heads to the nearest window and makes a remark how rain always come with some misfortune. All of a sudden, a member of the wall patrol sees something from afar, but it's hard to distinguish due to the rain. As such, the two decide that it must be nothing as they probably got something in their eye or maybe just saw some fog instead. However, misfortune indeed comes with rain as the guards get ganked and knocked out by a mysterious figure. And it wasn't misfortune from League of Legends. It's then revealed that the mysterious figure is actually the new girl that looks exactly like a girl version of Karim. After clearing out an entire wall section by herself, she be lying straight to the outside of Karim's window, looking on as if she needs a signal to pursue further action. So now we go from Attack on Titan to what seems like Assassin's Creed in literally less than one minute. Meanwhile, Herring heralded as the Prince Behemoth is busy laying down on his bed, feeling a little bit helpless, as he feels like something bad is about to happen. But then it turns out the only reason he's feeling bad is because him and his Prince Behemoth is busy wanting to know where Era could be, as he misses her and her wonderful rice cakes. Luckily for him though, the legendary Era also feels the same way, 
as once you experience the Prince Behemoth, you can never turn back as your world has been turned upside down. Elsewhere, the mysterious girl ends up pulling out a crossbow and aims straight at the window of Karim. However, it's revealed that the mysterious brown riding hood is armed with no ordinary arrow, as she's actually armed with an explosive arrow. So let's just watch as we let her cook, because it seems like Karim is either planning to escape or this girl is trying to get revenge at Karim for whatever reason. With the thundering explosion rocking the entire area, Adonarin and every other Black Thorn member stationed to protect the area get shocked at what they just heard. At the same time, Ara is unfazed since she's part of FaZe Clan. But in reality, she's currently stuck in a dream state dreaming about our boy Herring. Shortly after, she snaps out of it and instantly breaks open the lock on the door, as she's the one tasked to make sure Karim does not escape. As the door breaks open, she finds Karim standing on top of the rubble right by the opening looking like he's contemplating if he should leave right now. And so he stands there posing like he's some kind of man transformed into a demon ready to start his villain arc. He then jumps as Arai yells at him to not do it, since if he jumps there's no going back past the point of no return, but he ends up finally deciding to go through with it. Suddenly, Ara hears a flying projectile steaming towards her, but she's able to dodge last second and avoid the direct hit allowing a blast to send her flying into a bed. With the second explosion, the intruder alarm is finally activated but the Black Thorn are busy calling for support from the nearby wall archers, but none are to be found standing upright. As such, the Black Thorn leaders order Ara to take charge in finding Karim, since he is the number priority for the Crimson Foxes after all, while the rest pursues the intruders. The commander then commands everyone to make sure they block every and all exit, as they cannot let Karim escape the city. Unfortunately, normal city guards are no match for the king's simp, as he's too agile and too powerful for them to even stand a chance. Thus, Ara chases in pursuit with two other Black Thorn members assisting her, but as she chases she wonders what his motive could be since this would ruin his chance at becoming King of the Wolves. Back at the Gomage, the elite Garimbi members watch on from their windows as they witness their own captain make a run for it. So they start thinking if Karim left them in a battle royale where they must play last man standing. But let's be honest here, the boys are shocked only because they finally realize with Karim escaping, they will now be unable to continue rice cake smashing as round 2 has been cancelled. Anyways, with Attack on Titan vibes filling up the entire atmosphere, Yama was surprised to see Edo Naren is actually here in person to command the entire Black Thorn squad herself. As such, Yanwu begs Naren to allow her to help in any way or form, especially if she's allowed to pursue the man that will be the future father of her kids. But s tier Yanwu without her glasses gets utterly rejected by the captain, so Naren tells her she has no time to argue with her so she must follow Black Thorn protocol before barging out of the room. Meanwhile, Karim continues on his mad dash to escape the city of girls, but the mysterious girl is able to catch up allowing her to yell for his attention. Upon garnering his attention, she perfectly throws a sword over to King Simp like some kind of medieval drybee, so he catches it with ease. The two then make some dramatic eye contact with each other. But this is basically Karim's way of saying he's grateful for the pizza delivery. Regardless, she's also star 1 and level 5 herself, so she needs to hurry up, but she's able to perfectly dodge every arrow sent barreling towards her. She then proceeds to scale down multiple city walls like an absolute unit, proclaiming that from now on, every action of hers is of her own free will. Meanwhile, Ara locks in her flow state so she's able to catch the king's simp to deliver a quick attack, but now she's mad she has to chase him, as this will ruin her chances of spending time with Herang. However, much to her surprise, he's able to block her attack as Ara thought he was unarmed the entire time. And so the two face off again against one another, but we all know Karim has never once won a single battle against the reincarnation of Arya. Suddenly, Ara stops in the middle of her charge and decides to pull a big brain move by channeling her inner e-girl persona, so she basically gives the king simp the chance to simp right now. But for the first time ever, he decides not to simp and instead stares her down like a true evolved Sigma male. But then, as he continues staring at her, the two Black Thorn members assisting Ara blocks off his rear exit, so they attempt to order him to not make any sudden foolish moves. Now cornered and trapped, Karim turns back to Ara and he finally mumbles some words by telling her to make sure she holds her breath, but Ara is utterly confused to what he means. Out of nowhere, a gust of wind erupts like some kind of bomb has been set off, so Karim stands there all cool in front of Ara. She then tries to hold her breath. But Karim ends up showing his true colors as he hints to her that it's important she holds her breath in the future. With Ara still unable to decipher the true meaning of his hidden message, she is forced to watch on as he escapes through the man-made fog. As the target has now been lost, she starts to sigh and says out loud that they have actually lost sight of Karim. 
Elsewhere, some of the Garimbi boys begin banging on their doors and attempt to follow suit, just like their captain. But Blondie looks on in glee as she knows if they do anything stupid, they will instantly get punished, so that means she finally might be able to join in on the fun by playing with some rockets potentially. Eventually, the one in charge and protecting the Gomage site gets absolutely irritated, so she orders all archers inside to get ready to fire at the door. With everything escalating faster than a man can get their banana tree plantation fully grown, all the guards ready their crossbows and prepares to fire once the door breaks open. Mere seconds later, a barrage of arrows coming flying straight at the wooden door, as the Garimbi refused to stop any of their advances. However, not a single arrow went through the wooden door, so Wong sighs and peeks out to see what awaits him if he decides to escape. Suddenly, he decides to activate the signature skill of Shield Charge, causing even more frustration within the ranks of the Black Thorn watching from afar. As such, Blondie spins into action like a Beyblade, telling Wong to allow her to send him straight into the pits of hell. Thus, Blondie sends him falling forward with his shield still intact, but since the Blackthorn supervisor is in front of him, she accidentally moves backwards causing a recruit behind her to accidentally cause friendly fire. Now that even more commotion is caused due to teammate damage, Wom takes the chance to quickly check nearby rooms and search for the other Garimbi members. After successfully finding the room containing Maru, Wom throws him a sword that he stole from a nearby recruit and proceeds to sit on top of a balcony overlooking the entire area. The guards then hesitate to make a single move as they get flustered at seeing two men in action, due to these new recruits never seeing boys this close before. Eventually, one of the new recruits snap out of it, and she orders everyone else to fire. Unfortunately, they all end up being total nudes as most forgot to reload after their initial fire, and some are still too distracted due to the sight of the two boys. While the girls attempt to stop Maru and Wom, boss music begins to play as Herring, the prince behemoth, stands firm right by his door, awaiting for his extract to happen. Now if I were these girls, I would be scared of Herring coming out of one of these doors as Bro is actually able to wield his Prince Behemoth as his ultimate weapon, as he can literally send people flying with it. Eventually, the time has come with the door creaking open, but then Maru asks him if he's coming with them or if he wants to stay here as the only elite Garimbi in captivity. Herring then decides to walk out of the room, causing every girl to abruptly stop in their tracks, even Blondie and the supervisor stops what they are doing to stare at Herring. With everyone now stunned and in disbelief to see the Prince Behemoth, the boss music stops due to Herring looking at Blondie with some regret, telling her that it's quite unfortunate that they find themselves in such a pickle. She then responds by asking what the heck he's doing here, but Herring only replies by claiming that it's a good question. Regardless, Herring decides to move to the balcony, when the rest of the guards begin to whisper to each other that they can't believe Herring is the Prince Behemoth. With Herring distracting them all by accident, Mon and Maru take the initiative and proceed to clear a path forward to the exit. However, Herring does nothing to help his two squad members, instead he goes being chilling with Blondie as she's busy telling him that she has a really bad feeling about all this. 